The issues that we're facing are quite simply this. We lost office in 2010 on the back of a financial crisis brought about by the banking collapse in the USA and consequent collapse here. It was brought about by crazy investments, by the subprime mortgage crisis, by the greed of bankers, by the lack of regulation. It was brought about by a whole lot of circumstances. It was not caused by the alleged overpayment of nurses, street cleaners, factory workers or anybody else. It was not brought about by the benefit system or the cost of the National Health Service. And we were told the only way forward was to set an arbitrary date to move back into budget surplus, an arbitrary date by which we'd pay down the debt. Incidentally, the debt has gone up under George Osborne, not down. And that, uh, as a result, there would have to be austerity. Austerity being cuts in public expenditure, loss of several hundred thousand jobs in the civil service, wage freeze for public sector workers, cuts in benefits, cuts in the living standard of the poorest, freeze on council house building virtually throughout most of the country, and you look at the results. What are the results, really? The richest five families in Britain, the richest five families, the fingers of one hand, own the equivalent of the total wealth of 20% of the entire population. The richest 30 families, the richest 100 families, own the equivalent of 30%. We live in a grotesquely unequal society, and that inequality is getting worse. My objection to austerity is that it is not an economic formula, it is a political formula about rebalancing our society, possibly in the image of the 1930s and probably in George Osborne's mind more likely the 1830s. It is all about rebranding re our society, reducing the role of public services and increasingly putting the bill onto the individual. Indeed, David Cameron was thinking aloud a few weeks ago saying how about we get rid of national insurance and just have individual insurance as well. Well, it might work very well if you're a wealthy family to have individual insurance to guarantee yourself against any ill that comes about. The whole point, the whole point of national insurance and the welfare state is that we all protect each other, we're all protected by each other. <laughs> and so, you have to ask yourself a couple of questions. This austerity and inequality, what's it doing? Slicing apart local authority budgets, slicing apart household budgets, closing libraries, closing facilities for the elderly, closing care centres, closing lots of things, and privatising, privatising, privatising all along the way. The uh, numbers of families in Liverpool that are hit because of the combination of the change in tax credits and benefit cups, half of all the families in Liverpool are going to be hit by this budget and this welfare bill that's gone through. That is the strategy they're following. Now, if I asked all of you now, to stick your hand up, please don't do so because it would be a forest, um, <laughs> if you supported the principle of a health service free at the point of use as a human right, you'd all say yes. No question. You'd all say absolutely yes. It was the great achievement of the post-war Labour government. It's the great achievement of Anarin Bevan that he managed to push it through. I might add at a time when... I might add, at a time when uh, the uh, debt ratio was 250%, it's now 80%. That government invested in people, in hope, in the future. This government does the opposite. But the other question is the one that we seem to want to run away from and shy away from. I'm shocked every time I see somebody sleeping on the streets. I'm shocked when I go to flats and houses around the country where children are growing up in grossly overcrowded conditions. I'm shocked when families view the onset of the school summer holiday with dread and horror because their children will no longer get a free school meal and possibly a free school breakfast. 
There is something deeply wrong about a country and a society that is prepared to, to accept and tolerate the levels of inequality, desperation, destitution and poverty that exist in modern Britain. We don't need... We don't need to go down the agenda set by Benefit Street and others. We need, I think, to take a moral principle. And that moral principle is quite simply this. If a society can provide health and education for all, it can also provide housing for all, it can also ensure we have a social security system that gives real security. So I want any future government's success or otherwise to be measured by all the normal economic indices that are there, but I also want it to be measured by the levels of poverty that's reducing, the number of children that are no longer going hungry, the number of people that are no longer sleeping on the streets, the number of people that are able to live and contribute normally within our society. Surely we're an inclusive society and these things are possible. Now, that is achieved by two things, and Alex is getting concerned about the time. He's always concerned about the time. It's something that concerns Alex a great deal. <laughs> He's a man of much concern. Uh, two areas I just want to briefly mention, because I think they're very important. The first is education and the education system as a whole. The numbers of children that access preschool education ought to be every child has the option of a free place in preschool education. It shouldn't be a lottery, it shouldn't be based on income, it should be based on the needs of the child and children's socialisation before they get to school is something that's very important. The children's centres, sure start, we're a great step forward, it's tragic the way they're being destroyed at the moment, but can't we provide something decent for all our children? But the Tories have um, other ideas, and the other ideas uh, later on in the school uh, age are to turn primary and secondary schools into academies, and any council that wants to open a free school can do so. Any council that wants to open a normal, state, community comprehensive, forget it, there's no money available for it. I don't want to close any schools, I want to keep schools open. But I do want to strengthen the whole concept of the local education authority, the family of schools, and bring those academies and free schools back into the normal local authority system. And while we're on with it, and I know it sounds very extreme and very far-fetched, but to insist that every teacher in a free school is actually qualified to teach it seems, to me, it seems to me quite a good idea. Um, but the teachers have been denigrated by this government and sadly occasionally by people in my own party in the same way that medical professions are being denigrated now merely because they've raised concerns about the idea of seven day working without the necessary new staff recruitment and changes that can make that a reality. But there is another issue and that is the way in which working class youngsters get a chance to go to college and go to university. The cancellation of educational maintenance allowance means that many young people simply don't want to stay on at school because they can't afford to and therefore miss out on A-levels, miss out on the chance of going to university. Those that do go to university, and I was talking to a young man today who just graduated, we were at a rally in Preston, and um, I congratulated him on his degree, said well done, hope things go well for you, and he was very pleased with the degree he got and he deserves those congratulations a great achievement. And I said, what's for you now? He said, um, £52,000 worth of debt. £52,000 worth of debt. Because he worked hard, got his A-levels, worked hard, went to university, worked hard, got a degree, and he's now got that level of debt. Well, I voted against the introduction of fees in the first place. I voted against it when it was, um, when it was put up to 3,000, I voted against it when it was put up to 9,000 and I think we have to look at ourselves and say what kind of society are we in when we penalise people for being educated? Because if somebody is a good engineer, 
Somebody is a good lawyer. Somebody is a good doctor, a good surveyor. All the other things that are so important, we all benefit. If it's a good doctor, we benefit. You know that. You know that. You know the reality. Education is not just for the individual. Education is for the society as a whole. And when people say we can't, we can't afford it. We've done some looking at figures. We don't exactly know what the situation is going to be like by 2020. But by the calculations that we've worked out, we've got a good team of people doing it. Uh, we could raise the corporation tax. Instead of cutting it by 2%, raise it by 0.5% would be enough income to pay for the fees of all students in university. That, to me, is absolutely a price worth paying. Other countries manage to do it because they value that education. But while we're on with it, let's have an attitude towards education which is about the value of learning. I'm shocked by the way in which adult education is being cut back. Opportunities cut back for people with learning difficulties, people with mental health conditions, and so many other things. Education isn't just for qualifications for work, it's also for the benefit of society as a whole. Maybe there are some people that don't like us to be too well educated, don't like us to be thinking too much, don't like us to understand our history and where we've come from. The last point I'll make is this, because it's a hot evening. And I want us to be able to um, listen to each other and talk to each other a bit as well. Is the issues of environment and peace and justice around the world. We cannot go on as a planet consuming raw materials at the rate we are, polluting the sea at the rate we do, destroying the atmosphere at the rate we are, and by strong environmental regulations on both sides of the Atlantic, more this side than that, it must be said, um, exporting pollution to the cities of India and China. Because when air pollution becomes air pollution, be it nitrous oxide, sulfur dioxide, or anything else, it doesn't stop at national borders. It's very disrespectful of national frontiers, these winds are, as the seas are as well. If we pollute anywhere, we pollute everywhere. If we destroy here, we destroy there and everywhere else. So I think environmental policies are as much an attitude of mind about how we consume, what we consume, and how much we consume, but also using our brains and our technology for sustainable generation of clean power and electricity. This, this, city, this city led the way in clean water in the 19th century when Liverpool Corporation built Lake Verney, the pipes and the dam that went with it, and showed what municipal enterprise could achieve. Why can't that same municipal enterprise be used to generate sustainable sources of electricity and develop things in that way? There is much that we have to achieve in those areas. And the inspiration of those people that draw our attention the destruction of the natural world and the ecosystem. To me, they're eco-heroes, and we should respect them for what they're doing. But I also want to conclude with this thought. I voted against the Afghanistan war, the Iraq war, and I was one of the organisers of that Million Strong March. And we had massive meetings here in Liverpool against that Iraq war. When wars are over, the victors write the history. The victors decide who's won, and the victors tell the rest of the world who's won. What they don't usually tell you is who's lost. And I'll tell you who's lost. Those desperate people in refugee camps in Lebanon. Those desperate people in refugee camps in Libya. Those desperate people dying in the Mediterranean. And indeed, some of those desperate people in Calais, which the Prime Minister describes as a swarm. Can we, stop being, can we stop being a world of brutality? Can we stop being a world of condemnation of people? 
When somebody is desperate, they do desperate things. Cannot we be humans and reach out to those humans and try and help them, not condemn them? And so, my ideas, they're not easy, they're not simple, but a world based on the aspiration of decency, human rights and justice rather than nuclear weapons and the ability to destroy is something surely that's well worth striving for and working for. This meeting tonight is about lots of things. At one level, it's about an election campaign. At another level, it's about the future of the party. But at another level, it's about the hope that exists within all of us. The hope that we can build a movement, a sustainable movement, that is for social change. That we can stand up towards injustice. We can work towards the decent, equal, fair society that those people that founded our unions and founded this party and have written work so hard for so long can be brought about. If we can live in a society where everyone matters, everyone cares for everybody else, and everybody cares for everybody else, you can call it anything you like. I prefer to call it socialism, but I don't mind if you want to call it humanism, humanitarianism, anything you like. But a society based on the idea that you respect everyone and care for everybody is actually a much happier, more prosperous, more successful, more peaceful society. We have launched a social movement in this, and I'm proud of all the young people that have come forward and all the people that have come out to help in this campaign. Last night, only five weeks into this campaign, we received our 6,000th volunteer to sign up to come and help in this campaign. Whatever the outcome of this election on September the 12th, whatever the outcome, we're still going to be here. We're still going to be demanding an economic policy for all, not the few. A social policy for all, not the few. A world of peace, not at war. And demand that our party and our representatives don't sit around for five years waiting for the next election. But get out there now and oppose the welfare bill, the Tory, the, the trade union law and all the other things. Thank you very much for this meeting this evening. <laughs>